Welcome to Victory Baptist Church. Thank you for tuning in. Today's message was delivered on October 31st, 2021 by Pastor Josh Walker. So join us as we continue our series through the book of Luke. Uh, so I, I've mentioned this before um, that I'm kind of I'm interested in wilderness survival. I think specifically what I said was that I watch a lot of um, survival shows. Uh, so when it comes to wilderness survival, I don't know exactly what it is, but something just fascinates me about the idea of being able to go off into the wilderness and being able to fend for yourself. So I want to start today off with a little bit of wilderness survival. Who knows? I, I hope maybe this, well, I don't hope, but maybe this will save your life someday. Um, so imagine this. You and your family or you and your friends, if you're not married, um, you're out on a hike and you get yourselves lost. Now, if you're anything like me, I, I'm stubborn. And when I get lost, I continue to just kind of meander around. Um, and that only serves to get me more lost. So now evening comes and you realize you are legitimately lost, okay? And you're forced to huddle with your friends or family through the cold night, and then at sunrise, uh, you begin looking for a path, a way out. Uh, but the night has kind of wore on you, and you're a little bit uh, hungry and famished, right? And, and, and there's no sign of a trail anywhere. And then you come across um, a bush with some berries or some, some fruit on it. Now, the question is, could you or, or, or should you eat these berries? Okay, and so this is, this is the part where I save your life, all right? Here is your wilderness survival berry mnemonic, okay? White and yellow, kill a fellow. Purple and blue, good for you. Red, eh, could be good, could be dead, okay? So has anybody ever heard that before? Nobody? Okay, so people, a few people have. So this is all you need to know. Statistically, 90% of white or yellow berries that you'll come across in the wild are poisonous or dangerous. White and yellow, kill a fellow, okay? Conversely, 90% of purple and blue berries are in fact good for you and, and safe to eat. So purple and blue, good for you. Now red, when it comes to red berries, they're, they're really 50-50. Half of them are, are, are good and safe, and half of them will drop you dead. Okay, so red, eh, could be good, could be dead. All right? So it's a very simple mnemonic, but why all of this talk about berry identification and, and wilderness survival? Well, in wilderness survival, it's, it's important that you're able to recognize berries or fruit to ascertain whether they are good and safe or good and bad. Likewise, in life and in the Christian walk, it's important to be able to identify and recognize spiritual fruit, both yours and others. So you need to be able to do this in order to live in a way that is good and God honoring and also to avoid those that produce dangerous or evil fruit. Being able to distinguish bad and good fruit is critical. It's crucial. It's a crucial element of what it is to be a follower of Christ and to live the Christian life. Today's text, Luke 6, 40, Luke 6, 43 through 45, is pretty straightforward. This is the message. The fruit of a person confirms the root of a person. The fruit of a person confirms the root of a person. And, and I pray that we'll see that a person's fruit their thoughts, their actions, and their words expresses or declares the condition of their heart, their root. So as I said, I think the text before us, even though it is metaphorical, is pretty straightforward. But even though it's straightforward, we need to spend a little bit of time explaining it and expounding it. But a lot of our time this morning will be dedicated to applying it, okay? So let's just start with a simple exposition. Let's look at first at verses 43 through 44. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. 
So let's take it bit by bit and kind of put it all together. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. Now, there actually, there's a couple ways that people have come to understand this, and frankly, I think both of them are useful. But first, and most kind of germane to, uh, to the context that we have, a tree that is good, known for producing a safe and good fruit, will not produce a bad or dangerous fruit. A Granny Smith apple tree will always produce a fruit that is safe and good to eat. What I mean is that it, it will not, it, it cannot suddenly produce a fruit that is bad or dangerous. That, that just, that doesn't happen. It's a matter of identification. A Granny Smith apple tree always produces Granny Smith apples. On the other side of the coin, a tree that is known to produce, produce a bad or dangerous fruit isn't going to suddenly produce a good and safe fruit. Uh, there's a tree <clears throat> that looks somewhat like a small apple tree. It's called the manchineal. Um, it's grown in tropical regions from Florida down into the Caribbean, into the Central and South America. Has anybody ever by chance heard of the manchineal? I didn't think so. We got one, one up front. I I've never heard of it either. Now, in a lot of ways, the manchineal tree looks like a smaller Smith, Granny Smith apple, but the manchineal tree is definitely not something you want to eat. In Spanish, it's called la manzanilla de muerte. La manzanilla de muerte. Any Spanish speakers in here? Okay. La manzanilla de la muerte, I think right off the bat you know it's not good. In English, it's translated as little apple of death. Now, do you want to eat, nay, or eat any fruit that's got a nickname like that? I, I assure you that you do not, right? Because initially, it has a very sweet flavor that, it, that in short time turns to a, an intense and unbearable burn in your mouth and throat that in quick order turns into your throat closing and you suffocating and dying. How about this? Just touching the leaf of a manchineal tree will cause burning lesions on your skin. If you're around a burning manchineal tree, let's say they caught on a forest fire, and you come into contact with the smoke, it'll cause you to go temporarily blind. And don't make the mistake of seeking refuge or shade under a manchineal tree, or you might actually get toxic sap dripped on you. Many times the locals, they'll paint a big red X on the manchineal tree to, to kind of designate it as this is a bad, bad tree. Now, I, I, I was at, side note, I was looking into why we don't chop these down then, um, and it has some ecological reasoning, like as part of the ecosystem. But anyways, the point here is that this tree produ that produces this dangerous fruit isn't going to someday produce a, a, a fruit that is healthy and good and safe. That has never happened. And it will never happen. I mean, think about it. You wouldn't go up to a manchineal tree, properly identify it as a manchineal tree, and go think to yourself, you know what? I I'm going to give it a shot. Who knows? It might be good for me this time. I don't know. You would never do that, right? A tree is known by its fruit. Continuing on here, it says, for each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes from a bramble bush. You can identify whether the tree is good and safe, or on the other hand, bad and dangerous by its fruit. Even though the Granny Smith apple and the Death apple have some similarities, they're quite different. You can tell the difference. The manchineal tree uh, fruit, it, it's, it's round and green, but it's, sm it's much smaller than a Granny Smith apple. If you, want, if you approach a tree and, it, and it's bearing Granny Smith apples, you can be sure that the tree is good. You can be sure because just as you won't find a fig on a thorn bush or a grape on a bramble bush, you also won't find a Granny Smith apple growing on a manchineal tree. When you approach the tree, you look at the, the fruit and that identifies what type of tree it is. That's simple, right? So if you come to a tree and it has Granny Smith's growing on it, you can feel safe touching its leaves. Uh, 
You can feel safe that if you prune the branches and throw them into a burn pile, that you're not going to go blind. It's really quite simple. A tree is made known by the fruit it produces. You can identify the tree by the fruit that hangs from its branches. So remember, as we begin looking at the meaning of this text here, I said that there was a couple different but similar ways that people have come to understand this. And I've just explained what I think is the most relevant understanding to our text, but I want to quickly explain the other way, because I do think it's helpful. <clears throat> as we stated throughout our time here in Jesus' Sermon on the Plain in Luke, Matthew has a similar sermon referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. Now, Matthew's telling of this has a few little differences, and one of those differences can give us a slightly different understanding. Okay, so follow me here. In Matthew, instead of referring to good and bad trees, there are different Greeks, Greek words used that make a comparison between healthy and diseased. So in Luke, it's good and bad, and in Matthew, it's healthy and diseased. So if we, if we take this slightly different idea of healthy and diseased, we can understand the similar message. If a tree, right, is healthy and strong, it's going to produce fruit that is likewise healthy and good. Whereas if the tree is diseased, it's going to produce fruit that is diseased and rotten. A slightly different explanation that provides the same overall message. A tree is made known by the fruit that it produces. Healthy apples can only come from a healthy apple tree. And likewise, a tree full of rotten apple comes from a diseased source, a diseased apple tree. And as we look at verse 45, we really get at what is being said here. This is where the kind of the metaphor that's being used becomes clear. Verse 45. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So Jesus, he takes this metaphor that he's just given about trees and fruit, and he lays it besides, beside these words in verse 45. Just as a good tree produces good fruit, the good person from the good that is stored up and treasured in their heart produces good. And it is the same of an evil person. Just as a bad tree produces bad fruit, an evil person from the evil that is stored up and treasured in their heart will produce evil. Think about this. <clears throat> the heart of a person is spoken of more, more than a thousand times in Scripture. A thousand times the heart is spoken of. And you know what? The, the majority of those times is not speaking of the heart as a blood-pumping organ. Often when the Bible talks about the heart, it's referring to the spiritual part of a person. In the Bible, the heart is the residence and the location of a person's emotions, desires, and will. It's from that place that fruit will come. Fruit, of course, not of the edible kind, but of the spiritual and practical kind. If a person stores up and treasures that which is good, good emotions, good desires, a good will, what will pre be produced, words, actions, and thoughts, will be good. It'll be good fruit. But if a person stores up and treasures evil in their heart, the wickedness of their evil emotions, their evil will, their evil desires, will eventually be exposed by evil fruit. Does that make sense? The last statement here in verse 45 <clears throat> is, for out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. For out of the abundance of his heart, of the heart, his mouth speaks. So important because this is the thrust of the message. Whatever is in the heart of a person will be made known. And what is made known, the fruit that they bear, will reveal the condition and abundance of their heart. Here in this context, notice it's, it's specific. It's talking specifically of speech. Whatever is in the heart of a person will be exposed by what a person says. 
what is overflowing from the heart will come, in, come out in how we speak and what we say. The way we speak matters because it reveals the heart. And we're going to return to that idea here in a bit. But just because it's referring specifically to speech here doesn't mean that we shouldn't think of our, our thoughts and our actions as the fruit that we bear as well. Okay? Now, I said, that, I said at the beginning the message was the fruit of a person confirms the root of a person. And that is the plain meaning of the, the text. Th this analogy of good and bad trees and good and bad fruit is speaking of people. So in keeping with the analogy, people, we, are the tree, and our heart is our roots. Follow me. Fruit comes from the identity, the condition, the health of a tree. And the health of a tree originates or finds its source in its roots, right? Likewise, the fruit that we bear reveals our spiritual health. The spiritual health, which is born out of the heart, our root system. Fruit is a matter of the heart. Therefore, the fruit of a person confirms the root of a person. The things that we do, the things that we say, the things that we think reveal the condition of our heart. Quite simply, the fruit that a person bears identifies what kind of person they are, good or evil. Godly or ungodly, righteous or unrighteous. If you want to know the heart of someone, look no further than the fruit that they bear. As I've said, it's a pretty simple message, yet it's so vitally important to the follower of Christ in so many ways. I, I've said this before, but I'm going to keep on saying it until you get tired of it. Every text of Scripture has only one meaning, but every text of scripture has many applications and implications. And what I want us to do now is take Jesus's words here and apply them to our lives. Jesus said these words for a purpose to have us know something and to have us do something. And so as we consider and weigh the text, we need to ask ourselves, what would Jesus have us do with this? So as I think of this text, I see two uh, general or overarching ways that this could be or should be applied. And then under each of these general ways, I think there's a lot more uh, practical ways, and I want to touch on those, a few of those as well. So the two overarching or general ways that we should apply this message here are externally and internally. This should be applied externally as we view and assess the fruit of others. And it should be applied internally as we examine ourselves and our own fruit. So I want to, we have the external and we have the internal. And I want to start by first looking at the external. It's always easier to look at the faults of somebody else before you turn to yourself. The follower of Christ needs to be able to discern the fruit of others as they travel the wilderness of this present world. Moment by moment, the Christian comes into contact with others, and they need to, be, need to be able to determine who they've come into contact with and distinguish the good from the evil, to differentiate the godly from the ungodly, to divide the righteous from the unrighteous. We must do this. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You probably won't admit it, but some of you are thinking to yourself, Josh, we were just told last week that we're not to judge others. To which I would say, you might have misunderstood the, the verse slightly. While we are certainly, understand me, not to condemn others, especially in terms of salvation, we must be able to judge in, in the sense of discern the fruit of others. At many points in Scripture, Scripture commands us to do things that require or at least imply that we judge or discern the actions and characters Characters? Character of others. I mean, I, I was thinking about this. I could literally point to dozens, if not hundreds, of situations that would in Scripture that would require that we make a judgment. And so here are just a few that just came to the top of my head. <clears throat> We're told, don't throw your pearls before swine. How am I 
supposed to know who these swine are that I'm not supposed to let trample the gospel unless I can in some way judge their actions and their character. I must inspect their fruit. How about this? In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul warns the church in Corinth, and he says, do not have anything to do with the sexually immoral. That requires that there is a judgment made based on the fruit of others, what they say and what they do. You can only do that by making a judgment. Ephesians 5.11 reads this. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. You get the point, right? We must have nothing to do with those who walk in darkness and don't produce God-glorifying fruit, and this requires that we discern their behavior and their character. Believer, here's what we must understand. We have to discern the fruit of others. Now, listen, we must be careful that we do not judge others hastily or hypocritically or self-righteously, or unlovingly. However, we must look at the fruit of others, what they do and what they say. We are called to be fruit inspectors. Just as in wilderness survival, you must be able to discern the good berries from the poisonous and dangerous berries. In the Christian life, we must be able to discern those that bear good fruit from those whose work is poisonous. We must inspect the fruit of others. Now, let's look at an even more pointed and specific example of this by looking at the corresponding text in Matthew 7. Once again, the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus gives a similar message to what we see in Luke today, but there's some differences. And so I want to look at that real quickly. This is Matthew 7, 15 through 20, if you want to turn your Bibles there. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. So while this passage in Matthew is slightly different, like I said, from ours in Luke, hopefully you see that the overall tenor of the message is the same. You will recognize people by the fruit they produce. Notice, however, that in Matthew, there is a particular and and fixed reason that Jesus is talking about recognizing people's fruit. Did you pick up on it? It is so that people, his people that he's speaking to, his disciples, will be able to detect false prophets. That's the purpose. He tells them, beware of the false prophets. You will recognize them by their fruit. Look out for these types of people. You will know who they are by what they do and what they say. False prophets, they speak as though they speak for God, but what they actually do is lead people astray. They lead them further away from God. Jesus wants his people to be able to distinguish who these people are. And how will they be able to do this? By looking at the fruit they produce. Notice that these false prophets, they appear to be harmless. They're they're dressed in sheep's clothing, after all. But inwardly, in their heart, to keep with the analogy, at their roots, These deceivers are ravenous wolves who have come in to destroy the people of God. Now, we looked at this in Matthew, and Matthew's very specific about this. He's talking about recognizing the fruit of false prophets. But I actually believe that our text here is almost talking about the same thing. Let me me explain. Um, The first word of our text at the beginning of verse 43 is for. And When we see this word for at the beginning of a sentence or the beginning of a passage, we want to see what comes before it, okay? The word for is basically, it's like a red flag. And what it does, it says, in light of what was just said, now this. Or or, since that, now this. Or because of that, now this. 
So with that in mind, let's look at a, a few things that Jesus has said in the verses right before this that would require us to look at the fruit of others. <clears throat> Remember, Jesus is speaking primarily to his disciples, and the application of the sermon is directly pointed at them. That is the way we should understand Jesus' sermon. And David, he did a wonderful job uh, with that last week. However, I do believe that there's a little underlying theme where Jesus is ex also exposing the Jewish leaders of the day. Okay? So hopefully my slides will help. In verse 39, can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? Part of what Jesus is teaching in this verse is, is, is for the people to be careful following the Jewish leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. Though the Pharisees are the religious leaders, they are blind and they are leading the people into a pit. They have missed and rejected the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ, and they're leading others astray. False prophets, false teachers. The next statement that we see in verse 40, it kind of expounds on this a little bit more. A disciple is not above his teacher. A student, think about this, a student can only reach the amount of knowledge that his teacher possesses. I mean, think about it. Uh, I can't teach my civic students anything that I don't know, anything that I can't know or I can't show them how to get. The idea is that in aligning themselves with the Jewish teachers, the people have for, chosen for themselves limited teachers. The people can only rise to the level of their teachers, and their teachers are severely limited because they don't recognize who Jesus is. They have rejected his power and his authority. Finally, we get to the warning to look at ourselves before we try to help others. So look at the, the log that's in our own eyes uh, before we address the speck that's in our brother's eye. Now hear me, Jesus is, like I said, certainly pointing this at us. We need to tend to our own sins and shortcomings before we try to help others. But I do believe that as Jesus is saying this, he is also speaking of the Jewish teachers as well. Notice that in verse 42, I don't have that highlighted, Jesus says, you hypocrite. Jesus' favorite term for the Jewish leaders of the day was hypocrite. So while Jesus is maybe addressing and warning his disciples here, I also think that he's taking a little bit of a dig at the, at the Pharisees. Follow me. Just like the blind leading the blind and the limited teachers, the Pharisees, what are they doing? They're trying to deal with the sins of others, the specks that are in their eyes, before they deal with the log that is in their own eyes. They are completely blind to Christ, but yet they're making and passing judgments on their Jewish brethren. It makes no sense. So here's what I'm trying to drive home. In the immediate context, there's this underlying theme to watch out for, their, for false teachers, in particular, the Pharisees. Then in verses 43 through 45, as we follow context, right, and we get to our verses today, Jesus tells us that people are known by their fruit. Part of the purpose for Jesus' teaching in verses 43 through 45 is that we, as his people, would judge the words and deeds of others in order to discern whether or not this is someone we should align ourselves with, whether this is someone we should listen to, even more, whether this is someone that we should follow. False prophets, false teachers have always been at work, perverting the word of God and attempting to defile the people of God. From the Old Testament to the early church, and yes, even today, this has always been the case. And, and I don't want to overstate this, but the, this is the reality of the situation. Suffice it to say that American Christianity, and, and global Christianity for that matter, is filled with teachers, leaders, pastors, and so-called prophets whose fruit is evil. They embrace and propagate dangerous doctrine that really is just fruit of darkness. This fruit of darkness is used to dishonor God and to destroy his people. The book of Jude 
Its whole purpose is to warn Christians of this danger and calls for us to contend for the faith that was once for all handed down to the saints. So let us, let us contend and fight for the faith by recognizing the fruits of these false prophets, saving ourselves and saving others. In a very practical way, we must be careful not to place ourselves under the shelter of the death apple. We must place ourselves under those whose teaching bears righteous fruit that honors and exalts Christ. Teachers who contend for the faith by preaching and teaching and declaring the word of truth. You will recognize them by their fruit. That's the first way that we should apply our message today, inspecting the fruit of others externally, understanding that the fruit that they bear exposes the root of their hearts, avoiding and exposing those whose, whose fruit is poisonous and dangerous and harmful. Now, let's look at the other way that we should apply this, and that is internally examining ourselves, looking at the fruit that we produce. OK, so let's ask this question. Why is the fruit of believers necessary and important? Why is it necessary and important? First, and I know that this will come as, as no surprise to you, but the people of God have a holy calling. And that holy calling as sons and daughters of the God Most High requires that we bear good fruit. Listen to what Paul tells the, the Christians in Rome. Romans 7, 4. My brothers... You also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you, might, you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Believer, Christ died so that you could bear fruit for God. Even more, in John 15, 16, Jesus tells the disciples, and by extension, all of us, all of his people, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Think about that. Jesus chose you, appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. Why does fruit matter? Why is it important? Because you are chosen, appointed and commanded to bear fruit. Are you doing it? That is the first and primary thing that you need to ask yourself as you begin to examine yourself. Are you bearing fruit? And is that fruit good and healthy? Understand, this isn't all about just doing good things for the sake of doing good things. Remember our text today. The things that we do expose our hearts. The fruit of the person confirms the root of a person. So another, another way to ask this, I guess, would be what you think and what you do and what you say, does it proceed from an abundance of good in your heart? Because out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So really, it, it's two questions. Do you bear fruit? And even more, is that fruit good and healthy? So why is, why is the, the fruit of a believer necessary and important? Next, the good fruit of the people of God glorifies God. Also in John, 5, John 15, this in verse 8, Jesus says this. By this, my father is glorified. What? That you bear much fruit. The first question of the Westminster Confession of Faith, we have it up in the lobby if you ever want to look, asks the question, what is the chief end of man? The answer, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. We're told in scripture that whatever we do, we do it for the glory of God. Here it is. From the, from the beginning of all eternity, God chose a people for himself that he would set apart through Jesus Christ that would honor and glorify him. I mean, it, it adds another layer, another dimension, another level of importance when we think of our fruit in that way, doesn't it? I mean, if it doesn't, it should. Our good fruit bring, brings glory to the God that we profess to know and to love. Our lives are an act of worship, and the fruit that we bear in our lives 
is the glorifying fruit to God. Now, on top of that, on top of that, the next level, the fruit of a, of a Christ follower doesn't just result in them glorifying God. But when others see the, see the good fruit of the Christian, it causes these others to glorify God. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works, your fruit, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Saints, the, the fruit that you produce is important because it glorifies God. Your, your words and your actions, your, your good works are not only an act of worship whereby you glorify God, but it turns others to God and they glorify him. Is God's glory of first importance to you? I, I think often people will profess that it is, but, but the fruit that they bear declares otherwise. We are not saved by our good works, but as the saying goes, the proof is in the pudding. By the way, I, I know what that means, but I've never understood where that came from. So if you know where that comes from, will you see me after the service? Because I'm not sure. But the proof is in the pudding, right? The proof is in the pudding, or else, in other words, the fruit of a person confirms the root of a person. If God's glory is important to you, he and his glory will be the treasure of your heart. It'll be the root of your being. Well, as we said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, if God's glory is what you treasure, it will be made manifest in the fruit that you bear. That is the truth of it. Finally, <clears throat> the fruit of believers is necessary and important because ultimately it identifies us as the people of Jesus Christ. Once again, John 15, this time in verses 4 through 5, Jesus says this to his people. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It is impossible for anyone to bear fruit apart from Jesus Christ, to bear good fruit apart from Jesus Christ. And when we think of our salvation, this should be pretty obvious. Before a person is washed and regenerated by the blood of Christ, they can do nothing but sin. They can do nothing but sin. Every fiber of their being is consumed by sin. And sin, even the seemingly good things that they do, sin, It is only salvation through Christ that changes the heart. And it is from the abundance of this changed heart that righteous fruit can be produced. There is no alternative method. More to the point, after a person comes to faith in Christ, they are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of God that enables a person to bear fruit. And we get the idea of this, and we kind of see what spiritual fruit looks like in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Does the fruit that you produce look like that? Quite simply, does the fruit that you produce, does it bear the marks of a follower of Christ? If you are in Christ, your life will give evidence that he is yours and you are his. The fruit that we produce identifies us as the people of Christ. Brothers and sisters, all, all of us that, that, that profess the name of Christ, we must examine the fruit that we bear. We are to bear fruit because we are commanded and created to bear fruit to bear fruit that glorifies the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And ultimately, as we just said, it is our fruit that will identify us as the people of Jesus Christ. Today's text, it is vitally, vitally important. And, and I pray that you feel the weight of it. The fruit of a person confirms the root of a person. 
And we've seen how this truth should inform us as we look at the fruit of others being diligent to have nothing to do with the fruit of darkness, to be sure that we are following and aligning ourselves with those that bear righteous fruit, that we are finding nourishment from the fruit of good trees rather than those that will poison us. Also that we would inspect our own fruit because the fruit that we bear exposes our own hearts, whether we are honoring God. The fruit of a person confirms the root of a person. And I want to leave you with, with this, okay? Each tree is known by its fruit. Righteous fruit hangs from a righteous tree. And a righteous tree is only possible with a righteous root. And a righteous, or I'm sorry, you are only righteous as your heart is healthy. And a healthy heart is only possible through Jesus Christ. You cannot work yourself to a transformed heart. You cannot will yourself to a transformed heart. Heart transformation only comes through faith in Christ, that he has done perfectly what you did not do, which is live a sinless, perfectly obedient life. That Christ has died the, the death that you deserve because of your sin, taking upon himself the wrath of the Father. Heart transformation is only possible because Jesus imputes his righteousness to you. And his spirit, it comes to dwell in you. He gives you a new heart. The fruit of a person confirms the root of a person. Are you rooted in Christ? Is he the treasure of your heart? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Let's pray. Thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. This podcast is a ministry of Victory Baptist Church in Hermiston, Oregon. We can be found at 193 East Main Street, or you can also look us up at www.yourvictory.org.